All right. Well, thank you all for coming to, to the talk today um, here on Treaty 6 territory at the Peter and Doris Cool Center for Ukrainian and Canadian Folklore. My name's Andy Palmer. I'm the interim director here. Um, we see a number of friends of the Cool Folklore Center and, and uh, folks visiting from all over the place. So, so welcome to you all, whatever lands you're on right now. And um, we're, going to, uh, we're going to start in just a moment with a presentation by our speaker for today. And I'm just going to introduce him to you so that, so that uh, we can give him a welcome. Um, our, our speaker today is Adrian Nonjean, and he's a PhD candidate in the, in the history, in history at the Centre de Recherche Europe Eurasie of the National Institute of Oriental Languages and Civilizations in Paris, commonly known as ANALCO. Um, Adrian Nanjan holds an MA in Geopolitics and Political science, Sciences. From 2019 to 2021, Adrian was a research fellow at the George Washington University Institute for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies. He participated there in two research programs supervised by Professor Marlene Larue on transnational history of the far right and illiberalism. Um, I've had the pleasure of reading uh, some, of, some of Adrian Nanjon's works, um, uh, most particularly a work that would be available pe to people in, in um, English and, and in French, um, Forging the Body of the New Ukrainian Nation, Sport as a Gramscious Tool for the Ukrainian Far Right. And um, that tells you a little bit about um, about uh, what Mr. Nonjana has been been um, studying studying in his times. Um, he's a specialist also in the cultural and political history of the Baltic Black Sea region. Um, uh, the The work that he's going to be presenting to us today is called "The Spirits Never Die: Ukrainian Native Faith as a Spatial Historical." and political construct. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Adrian Nonshan. Thank you very much. Uh, so good morning, uh, everyone, or good evening for the one who are uh, in Ukraine and in Europe. Uh, I would say first that uh, actually it's a very big honor for me and also a quite intimidating uh, moment too because actually uh this is the first time i'm i'm speaking in a very prestigious center like yours who hosted many uh renowned scholar i follow the work uh like maria lesi who is also here in the uh as a uh, as a guest so uh uh, thank you very much for uh, this uh, opportunity. I will try to do my best despite the little stress I have speaking uh, here in not my native language. Uh, I would also uh, also want to thank all the organizers for making this uh, possible. Uh, first of, uh, of all, uh, Linian Pavluk and Andy Palmer, Natalia Lisimpenko, and also my colleague from a Young Scholar in Ukrainian Studies uh, Network, Voices Network, and Mitro Yisipenko, who was uh, very, so kind to, um, to propose me uh, to speak during uh, this event. Um, so I'm just going to uh, to share my screen now, and we will start. So um, maybe first, uh, first maybe it's important to say why I started to to uh, to get interested in the study of uh, neo paganism in Ukraine. So how I encounter the gods? I mean, uh, I'm not a pagan myself. Uh, I'm from a, a Catholic uh, family, but I just wanted to express how I mean uh, I I started to study paganism. So. Uh, actually, I started uh, the, with a BA in history from Sorbonne University, and then uh, I started a master degree in geopolitics in the French Institute of Geopolitics located in Saint-Denis near Paris, where I started 
to study Ukraine. So first, my first dissertation were about uh, uh, Ukrainian nationalism and uh, ecology and environmentalism movements uh, in Ukraine. And that's how actually I started to learn a little bit about uh, the, um, uh, the, the pagan discourse and the pagan movement in Ukraine. But at the beginning, it was not so much, it was a part of my research, but when I started to dig in, uh, I found very interesting, actually. Uh, also, uh, I realized that most of the studies related to paganism around the world are mostly dedicated uh, uh, to uh, sociology and um, anthropology, but uh, Nobody, not so much people, uh, start, tried to understand that paganism has a political discourse and political activism, and that's why actually, uh, that's what interested me at the, at the beginning. Of course, uh, reading some authors who also tried a bit to, to study this phenomenon as a political one, like Stéphane François, Marlène Laruelle, of course, Maria Lissi, Vukarina Erte uh, actually helped me a lot and encouraged me to, uh, to engage in this field. Uh, I would not be pedantic, but I, uh, I don't know if it's a luck or a shame, but uh, uh, nobody in France right now studies uh, Ukrainian paganism. Uh, I I think I am the only one, and uh, so that's also why uh, I started uh, to uh, to study it. But uh, what I uh, to, uh, what I presented to you, it's uh, only the academic interest, and I think that I started uh, many years ago before entering academia to get interested in paganism. Let me explain myself. Well. Uh, I think when I was in high school, uh, I I think I was part of the so-called geek culture. So with friends, I was playing uh, role games like Dungeons and Dragons. I was uh, reading uh, Tolkien. I was um, I was playing uh, video games, and that's how I encountered also mythology, folklore, uh, etc. But I think the most important uh, things wa was that with my friends we were also uh, listening to uh, metal music. And uh, you know, during uh, at uh, in high school you have a kind of uh, uh, competition who is the coolest of the one. So uh, everyone was trying to find the new uh, new band to be very original. And as I had already an interest for Eastern Europe uh, cultures, I started to listen uh, uh, bands from Ukraine and Russia, and I think that's uh, why I started to be also interested in paganism, because all these themes are part of the lyrics and uh, the shows that they, uh, they, uh, they do. So uh, so here, here is a, a little bit of the, uh, the story behind my interest, which is also one among others. So um unlike the west i would say that post-soviet uh pagani neo-paganism is not a marginal field we have many examples in the former soviet union uh first of all we can uh, speak about uh, the baltic states we are where the uh, pagan movements are very important just to go to some you have of course uh, romuva which has been now recognized as an official religion since uh, 2016 with the help of a local party, uh, the Social Democrats, and also the Union of Peasants and the Green Party as well. Uh, there is also the same in Estonia with Mavalakoda, which is a finno ungric uh, religion, uh, also recognized as, um, as a religion there. Um, in Russia, well, there are there are also uh, pagan movements. There were they are were quite active, quite important. But since uh, Vladimir Putin presidency and also the conservative turn of his, his presidency with the help of the Orthodox Church, there uh, Ukrainian uh, pagan uh, Russian pagans were persecuted. You have some quotes here I picked up right now. From Maria Novosti, and uh, you see that there is a quite of a hate against uh, uh, against the paganism in all his form. You can uh, there is neo paganism, but also uh, quite uh, uh, polytheistic and um, and tradition like in the Republic of Mario uh, in Murcia are, are also uh, persecuted persecuted. 
to mention the Ukrainian case, I mean, uh, uh, paganism is now very mainstream. It's popularized everywhere, not to mention traditional uh, uh, celebration like uh, Ivan Kompelo. You can find the pagan folklore uh, everywhere in music, in film. You have, uh, for example, here uh, the poster of uh, this uh, famous uh, fantasy movie, uh, Storoja uh, Zastava, uh, Stronghold in, in English. and uh, Oh, I would say also that uh, you can find uh, pagan symbol and uh, folklore everywhere. Um, for example, if you have a walk around the Saint Andrew Church in uh, in Kiev, you can find the people babushkas or people say, selling some jewelries uh, with uh, pagan symbols. And just to to check, uh, I went uh, a few hours ago on the on the website Etsy and I tapped down. Uh, uh, Slavic jewelry, and you can see that it's quite uh, widespread, despite the fact that you have uh, some symbols that now are uh, quite uh, problematic. So let's say that uh, uh, paganism, pagan folklore, is very widespread uh, uh, in Ukraine and in Eastern Europe in uh, in general. So um, I think a few words should be uh, said about what we call now neopaganism. So you have a different approach to neopaganism. Of course, you have a first this idea that it is, first of all, a philosophy understood as a refusal of contemporary materialism. So it can have a different forms. You can find this kind of philosophy in literature. Uh, for example, in France, we have Jean Giono, who is from south of France and wrote a lot about nature. And he had a kind of a pagan uh, mind. We can also find it in a philosophy with a problematic also uh, philo German philosopher Heidegger. Uh, anyway. But you have also this idea of an ecopantheistic discourse of universalist nature. Here, it refers mostly to uh, some kind of movement and religions created from scratch, such as new shamanism or new age or uh, new sorcery, such as uh, Wicca, which can be observed above all in the English speaking world. But what we call uh, neopaganism actually is people who want to recreate the cult of their ancestor uh, dated back to pre-Christian time. The, this is one important difference, but there is one more important difference, which is identity. Let me explain why. Of course, we can see some similarities with uh, New Age, the place of nature, the research of uh, self-realization uh, through mythologies and uh, rituals. But uh, I would say that the New Age is mostly built on uh, religions and spiritualities which are uh, not local. For example, in the, in um, New Age, you have a lot of uh, Buddhism, witchcraft, and they are often mis uh, mixed with uh, scientific or pseudo-scientific works, things sometimes with uh, esotericism and occult uh, elucubration. But neopaganism is for more, uh, foremost a resurgence of uh, pre-Christian na uh, native uh, polytheistic cults, and they are close to a romantic legacy, which is idealized, uh, um, idealized antique and traditional uh, societies. So you have the notion of identity, which is really, really important. I mean, uh, the self-realization through neopaganism is mostly an uh, ethnic one. Um, so neopaganism uh, draws uh, is drawn uh, on a number of uh, different sources, mostly anthropology, such as a Western fascination with uh, uh, indig for indigenous peoples and primitive cultures. You can find also they can find their sources in literature, contour cultures, and also from uh, religious uh, speculation. So. There is a kind of fascination for the, this uh, former uh, pre-Christian culture, and uh, so uh, to, co uh, to quote uh, the famous anthropologue, anthropologist Claude Lévi-Strauss, it's a kind of a bricolage thinker. So 
Regardless of this uh, consideration, Ukrainian neopagans reject uh, all of these labels uh, formulated by academic world to define them. Uh, the term pohansbo, literally pagan, is just perceived as uh, very pejorative by them because uh, for them it's, uh, it encompasses uh, unrelated beliefs uh, like uh, New Age. They mostly uh, prefer uh, Yazichny, uh, Yazichniki, which is uh, still pejorative, but it refers to the idea of Etenism. And uh, so, um, um, uh, yes, uh, Etenism, uh, native uh, religions, which uh, makes me now speaking about the true terms they want uh, to use. It's Ridna uh, Vira, which is a composed word associating Ridna, native, and Vira, faith truth. And this name emphasizes the ethnic and primordial nature of uh, uh, this religion. Um, um, so, uh, Ridna Vira, uh, like other neo pagan beliefs present in uh, Central and Eastern uh, Europe, are mostly polytheistic and holistic, taking benefits from post Soviet cultural rec uh, recompositions. They are mostly uh, uh, built around the cosmological concept of the world tree, Alatir, on which the existent world exists. Ridnavira has its essential foundation, the sacralization and personification uh, of nature and elements in a pantheon of uh, 17 deities, of which you can find uh, a rod, like the god of fertility, Perun, the god of uh, thunder and rain, or Dajbo, the father of gods. Uh, well, these are the main ones. Um, Rinoviri also implies the idea of uh, holism. It is a kind of a cosmic whole formulated around the three partisan. So you find first uh, Nav, the spiritual, invisible, or the overworld. You have also Yav, the manifested world, and Prav, the world of higher law. And as an intrinsic part of the second world, Yav, nature is enchanted by uh, neo pagan religions and it commands respect and reverence and reciprocity in the human mind. So, in this sense, I would say that the Rid Rinavira uh, proceeds from a form of hedonistic and vitalistic uh, fulfillment that is opposed to any form of modern materialism conducive to individualism and egoism. Despite these elements, the Ridnavira faith is, we will see, however, divided in different branches with their own pantheons, sources, and worldview. So it's really difficult uh, uh, to estimate um, the, the exact number of, uh, of pagan movements in Ukraine. Here I'm uh, using the, 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 the figures from uh, Maria Lissiv's uh, book. Uh, so uh, she um, we have a, a, a more or less 40 active communities with 10,000 members, but the, uh, I think there are, uh, there are more people who are not to declare themselves as a, as a pagan, as part of uh, the Rina Vira, and also with the war. Uh, myself, I lost all the, all the contacts with my uh, sources. So it's really difficult now to estimate the, 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 the real numbers of uh, adherents of uh, this uh, faith. But anyway, you have uh, two main organizations, uh, I would say. You have, uh, you have a first uh, uh, Runvira, the Reformed Ukraine Native Faith, and ORU, which is Obnednania uh, Renoriv Ukraini, so the Native Faith Association of Ukraine, which are uh, the two, uh, the most important ones. And of course, you have different uh, subcults uh, ranging from Nordic Odinist, uh, for, uh, I'm going to speak about them later, or regional beliefs like um, in Crimea, you have uh, people uh, related to Tengri uh, uh, religion. So, uh, where does uh, neopaganism Rinna Vira comes from? Um, so, uh, as you may know, um, official paganism uh, disappeared uh, at the very end of the 10th century, just after the Christianization of the Kivian Rus. We, in a uh, 
988 with uh, Prince Volodymyr, who picked the Byzantine writ of uh, Christianism, and uh, of and after um, in uh, 991 uh, there was uh, the establishment of a metropolitan uh, metropolitan bishop in Kiev. So former uh, pagan practices and beliefs uh, disappeared, but not really, I would say, because they uh, they uh, they persisted through the folklore of uh, rural communities, and most often far from a religious uh, center of power. So they are they didn't uh, disappear concretely. Uh, like other Slavonic cults, they have been uh, subjected to uh, the, a kind of uh, syncretic assimilation rather than a replacement imposed by brutality and uh, without a consensus. So you had a kind of uh, unofficial coexistence, uh, which had result uh, in uh, what Maria Lesiv called a dualist belief system. So it was not, uh, not on, uh, until the 20th century that the ancient Slavonic faith reappeared. So since the beginning of the world, the Cold War, at the end of 1945, the USSR had sought to maintain the ideological hold on the territories it dominated. Of course, you had the rivalry with the Western Bloc, uh, which was balanced from a military and diplomatic point of view. But you had at the same time a very hard cultural battle, which was gradually playing against the Soviet Union. So from the 16th, I would say, therefore, the uh, Soviet Union had to find other means to uh, rekindle the flame of uh, patriotism, even uh, if they had to contravene well-established uh, dogmas of uh, Marxism-Leninism. So from uh, this moment, uh, ethnicity arose the growing interest among Soviet scientists and intellectual elites. They were a bit uh, romantics and they try and they developed a kind of um, fascination for the first Slavs and of course their uh, traditional ceremonies and their ethnic roots. So by analogy uh, with the contemporary Russian people, which were considered by the state apparatus as the main driving force of the USSR, they elaborate a series of texts demonstrating the crucial contribution of paganism to uh, Soviet nationalism and Marxist uh, ideology. Indeed, Soviet ideology has always waged an uncompromising war against universal religions. This struggle was based on two arguments, the Marxist one, which is religion justifies exploitation, and another, uh, xenophobic, which is religions exercise a corrupting foreign influence to which uh, US uh, Soviet people, Soviet power had to respond with an original national culture. So first, uh, paganism serves primarily to encourage the atheist struggle against the Christ, uh, Christianity and uh, anti-Zionism, uh, because we were in the time where there was a confrontation between Arabic people uh, supported by USSR and Israel supported by uh, the, the United States, uh, which was considered by uh, USSR by uh, as the colonial imperialism. So they use paganism just to promote uh, uh, peasant folklore according to the principle of uh, scientific atheism. Uh, atheism. So this doctrine was based on the, the ephemeral nature of religions and their importance and uh, with a view to developing a socialist utopia and they identified the neopaganism not, at a, not as a religion dogma but uh, as a manifestation of uh, folklore. Um, at the same time, you had paganism spreading inside the intelligentsia and the dissident uh, milieu in uh, in USSR and especially in Ukraine. I would uh, so you can find some mention in the move, uh, literature uh, movement of uh, village writers with a uh, uh, famous author like Ivan Drach. But uh, I would say first that uh, despite this. Um, Neopaganism was mainly uh, designed, I would say, invented in the Ukrainian diaspora established in Western Europe and in the New World. 
So first, it started actually with uh, one, one, uh, one person, Volodymyr Shayan, who was born in 1908. Uh, he was a first philosopher and a Sanskrit. He was studying old Indian language. So Shayan was the first, the very first to attempt to recreate an Ukrainian native faith. Uh, during uh, the war, he founded uh, a first circle, which was called the Order of Night of the Sun, which was neo-pagan circles, but had also a uh, param uh, paramilitary dimension uh, inside uh, the organization of Ukrainian nationalists. But uh, um, after the war, Volodymyr Shayan uh, was forced to flee Ukraine in, um, uh, to Germany, then to London, where he completed his academic training and particip participated in the creation of several neo-pagan journals, such as Horden, where uh, you have a, a photo of the journal here, or even uh, Svitania. He was also uh, helped by uh, his disciple, Lev Silenko. But... Lev Silenko and Volodymyr Shayan had a disagreement about the nature of the faith, uh, and it, uh, it would have a very uh, important impact because Volodymyr Shayan kept uh, this idea of a polytheistic, uh, polytheistic um, cult, and Lev Silenko decided to uh, cop for a monotheistic religion, uh, Ronvira, with one god, which name is a dashbok. So, uh, they split, but uh, and Lev Silenko uh, emigrated uh, in the New World in 1944, and he founded the first branch of his reformed Ukrainian native faith. Uh, this movement spread a lot in the uh, in United States, uh, in Chicago, for example, in 1966, but you can find uh, also in Australia, you can find uh, uh, in Europe. And uh, on, uh, on parallel, Volodymyr Shayan founded also his own community in, the, in Canada, in Toronto and Hamilton, while he was cont contributing his work in London, where he died at the age of uh, seven, uh, 74. So after the liberalization of the Soviet Union brought by uh, Gorbachev in 1985 and the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, uh, all this movement had finally the possibility to gradually return uh, in Ukraine. So Runvira established itself in Ukraine uh, in 1992. And um, the Volodymyr Shayan movement owes its popularization, popularization in Ukraine to um, the um, philologist and ethnographer Halina Losko, uh, born in 1952, which, uh, who was um, a disciple of uh, Shayan's precept, and she founded, uh, according to his uh, principle, her own movement in Lviv in uh, 1993, called the Pravoslavia, the True Faith, and later she became the general director of Shayan's movement, which uh, she led under the name of Volkivnia Zoreslava, High Pretrials uh, Zoreslava. So, uh, Alina Losko is first an academic. She tried to bring on uh, pagan, uh, paganism and Rimnavira issue through, through publication about archaeology, ancient history of Ukraine, and she had quite a big success uh, among academia and intellectuals in Ukraine. And from all of this, uh, she federated many uh, groups belonging to the Cheyenne movement, and she founded in 1998 uh, uh, Oru, so the Ash Association of Ukrainian um, uh, of nati the native faith. Um, so, uh, and here are some of uh, the most important uh, publication of uh, Halina Losko. So you have, uh, she, she started to be famous with uh, her studies of folklore, which is called uh, Etno Naros Nashbo. And uh, the, you have also examples of uh, the, here, the journal of Oro, which is a Svaro in the name of uh, uh, the famous god of uh, the uh, uh, Slavic uh, Pantheon. Um, so, um, Ukrainian uh, paganism, Rinavira, I would say, is all, uh, above all an orientalist fantasy, more commonly known as Indomani. Indeed, both Shayan and Silenko are first and foremost religious specialists of India, 
each having uh, uh, made a career in the 20th century, which was a period indeed very, uh, of intense emulation for this field of study. So, um, in addition, uh, there was the, the problem of Ukraine, uh, because Ukraine was dominated by the uh, Soviet Union at the time, and they were absolutely deeply marked by their exiles in the West. And they tried through neo-paganism to federate the Ukrainian nation around a moral attachment to ancestral traditions other than those of the former Imperial Russia and the USSR. So it can be first seen as a, what Benedict Anderson calls the nation state building project developed in exile. So it's a question of reappearing in the collective imagination and nostalgia, a territory of reference to which to relate. Uh, uh, Benedict Anderson calls uh, it the homeland. So, of course, Red Navira is largely based on the Slavic rural folklore and traditions, uh, but uh, the mythological essence feature also the Vedic heritage. So, what is uh, Vedism? Vedism is uh, initially born in Russia in the 20th century, and it can be considered as uh, the eastern quest of the Slavic uh, tradition. So this is a philosophical current which was developed with the help of the ancient work of the white emigration uh, among the scientific cynicals and propose a Russian re-reading of the history of Slavic people and their spiritualities. Actually, they try to place themselves in an immemorial religious lineage, and Vedism link pagan Slavic religion to ancient traditions that came from India Peninsula and the Persian world. So, why? Uh, because they think that all the knowledge, all the reads, comes from one important manuscript from India religious, which is the Rig Vega. This is the main manuscript containing a collection of uh, uh, alleged Vedic hymns and mystical teaching. And this Eastern tradition would have really, uh, gradually spread to the West during various uh, uh, migratory waves that occurred uh, throughout antiquity and uh, came first in Russia, then also uh, in Ukraine. Of course, all this tradition had disappeared with the population change during antiquity, but Vedism would uh, nevertheless have survived by being assimilated into the Slavic pagan belief originating from the Volga and the Pontic area. So all of this actually is absolutely built. Uh, they are uh, using uh, uh, one important uh, fake manuscript, which is the Book of uh, Veles. Uh, it's a so-called proto-Slavic work discovered during uh, the civil war of 1917, and uh, that constitutes since 1960s their main source, their uh, main source uh, for uh, to to attest this theory. So they are using this idea of Vizim, uh, Vedism to justify a kind of racial or ethnic superiority insofar as it refers, first of all, to the celebration of a spiritual heritage symbolized by the figure of the Indo-European and his mythical avatar, the Aryan. So, Volodymyr Shayan and Lev Slinko, who studied uh, Vedism, uh, were convinced that the Vedic knowledge present in the north of India would have been transmitted by the Aryan people making Ukraine the true cradle of the civilization, uh, but you have a different interpretation. Actually, uh, Lev Silenko uh, is mostly inspired uh, by theosophist uh, theories. Uh, theosophy, uh, theosophy is an occult current born at the beginning of the 19th century under the pen of uh, Elena Blavatsky. And it uh, largely takes up the idea of fruit people who in turn have been vector of civilization throughout ancient history each of which developed the characteristics according to their environment. So, uh, Lex Linko used this, uh, this narrative in his opus Mahavira, which is the main book for uh, Runvira uh, cult. 
he thinks that uh, is using the word Oriana, which is uh, wrongly derived from the word Ariane, and Ukraine for Lev Silenko is the last shelter of these people that have been at the origin of the Brahmin language uh, knowledge contained in the Rig Veda. So, uh, but on the contrary, uh, Volodymyr Shayan, uh, and in his book Vira Pred Kidnashir, uh, Our Ancestors' Faith, uh, written in uh, 1987, uh, espouse a kind of ethno differentialist and anti Christian uh, vision using uh, the, uh, the Aryan myth. Uh, actually, uh, why so? Because uh, they try to preserve the identity and the purity of European civilization without claiming uh, racial superiority. It's called ethno differentialism. Um, of course, it's uh, uh, xenophobic with uh, inward looking attitude and uh, the interest of the race taking precedence over, over form of open and mixed policies. And of course, uh, both uh, Cheyenne and mostly also uh, Alina Losco cooperated with some uh, far right author, which were uh, actually uh, interested in this Aryan uh, thematic. For example, uh, Alina Losco, she is she was cooperating with uh, the New Right in France, and uh, uh, the New Right was quite influenced by one philosopher, neo-fascist one, which is Julius Evola, who used the idea of uh, Aryan, but he called them Indo-European because he thinks that they were uh, they had a primordial tradition. Uh, and use this to uh, distinguish the noble mind races, uh, races uh, that they were the guardians of wisdom and gnosis over the millennia. But uh, you can find also in Osvaro uh, different uh, new right authors like Pierre Krebs, uh, Guillaume Fay, or Alain, Alain de Benoit, which were uh, published by Alina Lusco. Um, um, here you have a kind of uh, picture of about what were the so-called Sla Slavic Aryan. Uh, so they think that yes, it was uh, the, the uh, Ukrainians were actually the true and the uh, heirs of uh, of uh, the Aryans. Why they are using this? Because they are trying to exalt a kind of identity through the cult. So here, the veneration of nature is very important and developed in Rinavira uh, writings. Of course, it differs from a Western pagan universalism insofar that the letter refers to the primarily ethnic heritage symbolized by the figure of the Aryan. Uh, for this, they are using this idea of uh, migration. Ukraine actually would have been the heart at the heart of a historical revolution characterized by the holy development of agriculture, animal husbandry, and craftsmanship thanks to the Tripilian culture. So the Tripilian culture, they are heard of the Neolithic uh, migration from Southwest uh, uh, Europe. And for them, this civilization would have, according to the historian, developed a culture, particularly ahead of its time, in particular by establishing the first human city over 4,500 BC. And they were actually, they think that they were, uh, they had egalitarian society, but also a religion center on fertility and nature cults. Actually, they are using uh, the theories from uh, the Lithuanian um, uh, scientist Maria Gibbontas in her book, A Living Goddess, which established this idea of, uh, of uh, the Tripilian and um, and uh, this idea of a veneration of nature uh, during uh, this time. So, but they are using mostly this idea of Arianism, uh, which refers to Vedism. Actually, uh, Alina Losko uh, thinks that Ukrainians are homo vedicus, which can be described by her by as a person whose goal in life is a spiritual perfection. 
which seeks to live in symbiosis with his environment. So this individu individual would be connected to nature through his soul by a holistic feeling that would allow him to acquire a global wisdom capable of perceiving all the power gravitating around him. So because they were governed by this holistic principle and fighting the funds functional, spiritual, and moral unity uh, that links human beings with nature and the supernatural, indigenous uh, Ukrainian societies would have maintained a dynamic balance within and between ecological and social systems through their belief and tradition. So you have here an exaltation of human solidarity with life and nature, uh, which is visible in the worship of the Mother Earth, which is similar to the Aryan practices which Rydnoviri claims to be. So because of their Aryan so-called Aryan roots originated from the Vedic tradition, Rydnoviri could be able to decode the world in, over, in order to better perceive the multiple manifestations of uh, uh, the divine. So based on this observation, we can uh, only better understand the importance here of uh, the Soviet anthropological tradition, because while you have the Anglo-Saxon school of anthropology, which dismisses any link between the environment and the process of biological development of people, Soviet uh, rationalism embodied by theorists like uh, Lev Gumilyov claims that the landscape um, necessarily influences the ethnic process. So ethnicist conception of Rydnoviri ecology and environment further share this Soviet non-dualist perspective. If in much of Europe, you have actually ecological thought which categorize human according to the individual, the Rydnoviri uh, and uh, for instance, Alina Losko equate ethnos and spirituality into a kind of a social Darwinian perspective in other world, the romantic myth of earth, uh, blood and the soil. So, they are taking up the Aryan myth of origin and adding the uh, theory of uh, polygenism and the mis mixing of uh, race and beliefs, which are considered by uh, some Rinoviri as a threat to uh, racial purity. In their mind, actually, the missing, mixing of uh, foreign cultures in the Ukrainian biosphere would ultimately lead to the destruction and uh, of a healthy atmosphere. So here you have a, uh, a quote from uh, from Halina Lesko about this idea, uh, ethno-differentialist uh, uh, idea. So you, you see that actually there is a kind of exaltation of human solidarity with life, uh, life and nature, uh, which is uh, visible in this cult of uh, Mother Earth. Uh, we can also quote uh, the psychoanalyst Carl uh, Gustav Jung as uh, because for him the myth is a project a projection into the collective unconscious of archetypes common to all, and the back, the pagan mythus would be for Ukrainian Rydnoviri the expression of an ethnic essentialism built on the nation of noble savage, a man uncorrupted by his permanent contact with nature. So if this concept embraced by um, ancient religions, tradition can initially be seen as a circumstantial solution to the gap of uh, that is widening between the Ukrainian nation and nature, it will be also offer an ideology, a worldview in which they can uh, recognize the Ukrainian nation and build itself. Um, um, also, the, if you have first the idea of defining what is the Ukraine nation, but you have also the, the need to define the territory. And for this, I, so in my research, I tried uh, to, uh, to use the, the notion of geopo uh, geopoetics developed by the Scottish poet Kenneth White. So uh, what is a geopoetics? Uh, it's a multidisciplinary field of study which aims to bring together science, philosophy, and literature for a better understanding of a global space as it is perceived. So 
actually King White uh, he carefully uh, studies the literary and geographical materials presented uh, in the poems uh, of travelers and he tries to uh, retrace their actual emotional perceptions so um, you have in the world uh, geopolitics this idea of the research of a trans uh, transcendental uh, process geo the earth and poetics a conversion of uh, uh, your experience into art and uh, Rinavira faith actually is a form of uh, geopolitics designed to enhance uh, the vedic and Aryan heritage uh, in ukraine uh, so it refers a bit to the idea of a lived space, uh, which is uh, not so far from the notion of ethnoscape. So the ethnoscape is a form of a metanational existence, and it allows for a progressive approach to the, to, uh, the others and preserve the uprooted and, uh, and the travelers from too much stressful contact with it. So this idea is um, more relevant when confronted with uh, the problematic of post-Soviet Ukraine, which is a state whose borders were born out of the collapse of the USSR, the other, and where the newly born national community is still struggling to build itself on the basis of the fundamental criteria of the so-called Western nation state, which is language, uh, culture, history, and which is also challenged by foreign powers like uh, Russia. So first, while the geopolitics promoted by the Vedic tradition of Ukrainian neo-paganism is downstream, uh, with also the question of ecology, it is uh, used as part of an identity politics turned against Ukraine enemies. So first, uh, first Ukrainian neo-pagan geopolitics needs to be the here qualified as it is more what I can call a national valorization through the aesthetic of the territory than an emotional and poetic approach to uh, the environment. So, uh, of course, they are trying to use it. And uh, the Ukrainian native faith has a goal which is re-enchantment of the natural world. The followers of Ridna Vira, uh, they try to establish through the Vedic read a new territory aesthetic that would be specific to them and above all that allow them to reconnect with their Aryan roots. It is a question uh, here of putting this idea into practice by giving it consistency through geopolitics. So they try to seek Aryanity in the uh, Ukrainian national territory and uh, all uh, the sacred places where uh, the human soul uh, can embody uh, nature. So you have different uh, many places which are considered uh, sacred and they are used for this purpose. Uh, you have Lysaora in uh, in Kiev. You have uh, you have the Black Sea for some uh, for for some uh, movement. Uh, which is also considered for some movement as the cradle of uh, the Aryan race called Hyperborea. Um, but uh, anyway, it's also uh, they are using uh, the cult and the myth. Uh, actually, uh, associated with uh, an ancestral homeland, where the soul and emotion of the Ukraine, uh, ukraino aryan identity lies, these natural territories led the individual to reflect on their own presence in the world and their heritage. So through this, uh, the ceremonies, most often punctuated by songs and solemn moments calling for meditation and reflections, all the adepts seems to lose themselves in their own thoughts, which are guided by the narratives and the prayers. So apart from these elements, which make Rinoviri geopolitics a search for a collective affiliation thanks to natural spaces in, uh, invested with a mythical dimension, it should be therefore see understood that the geo uh, geopolitics approach to pagan narratives through the Veda, Veda myth is above all motivating by sitting in our ex exaltation of, uh, um, of harmony. Um, 
so you have a very important place of uh, the local uh, here. Localism, uh, therefore, makes it uh, uh, possible to develop within Ukrainian Rinavira discourse of protection of the homeland and nature uh, in a determinist and uh, understanding of the environment. Um, so here you have uh, some uh, some uh, some very famous uh, place. Uh, two of them are in Kiev. Actually, here you have a monument to uh, uh, Slavic god Perun in uh, Lisaora uh, in Kiev. Also, you have one uh, one stone which is not so far from the Lavra in Kiev, uh, dedicated to, to the uh, to the movement uh, uh, Runvira and. Um, down you have a, a photo I made myself uh, in Lviv, um, in the biggest uh, park where uh, some members of Oru uh, celebrated the first day of, of spring because this place actually is the hill of uh, Yardillo, the, 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 the god of fertility, um, but also uh, spring as well. Um, and here, uh, based, uh, based on um, Maria Lissi work who make a very uh, important work. I tried, yes, to uh, to to make a map about yes this uh, ancestral and mythical uh, territory. Um, of course, um, to exalt territory and identity, you have to they have to find enemies. So uh, Ukrainian neo-paganism is considered as a tool for promoting. Uh, uh, balance between uh, ethnic communities, but therefore they try also to uh, to, uh, to protect themselves to foreign religions, which uh, uh, are corrupting the, uh, the true nature of people. This is actually uh, very true uh, for uh, uh, monotheism, especially uh, Christianism, because as they are very uh, dedicated to the worship of nature, they think that uh, Christianism is uh, was bad for um, for nature because it's originated from a uh, desert area in Palestine and they had no conception about nature etc and they mostly referred to the Genesis where you uh, where Yahweh said to Adam and Eve be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it for so for the for uh, for uh, for uh, Rinoviri, uh, Christianism at large is anthropocentrist and uh, uh, allow the people to destroy uh, the nature. You have also uh, critics about uh, Marxism because uh, for them, uh, there was a huge, uh, the, the, they criticized modernity, modernity destroyed nature with the catastrophe of uh, Chernobyl in 1986. So um, they, uh, they try, yes, to, uh, they confront all uh, this, uh, this, uh, uh, this phenomenon, but I'm speaking, uh, I have no time to develop more. Um, and just to finish, yes, so here are the main principles uh, of Rinavira, but nowadays we had also new uh, variation of, uh, of Rinavira. Actually, it's not so much linked to uh, the two main, uh, main religious uh, movement, and especially in Ukrainian nationalism, you had a new uh, new cult who appeared, uh, which appeared. So, of course, in nationalism, and uh, actually, actually in the far right, uh, you have a kind of a fascination for neo-paganism. Um, and we we see uh, in Ukraine, but also in uh, in different uh, Eastern European countries, that now in some groups they are trying to promote a new kind of so-called Slavic religion, but which is mostly referring to uh, Nordic cult, which is also uh, intending to be. Uh, fundamentally identity-based using the Aryan myth. And you have, for example, Odinism, uh, which is a variation of Nordic, Germanic, Paganism. 
Of course, uh, here in these groups, uh, they found their roots in the German uh, Romanticism at the end of the 19th century, uh, which uh, see uh, the, the rise at the very end of the uh, 1920s, uh, the Folkish movement, which was an intellectual and militant uh, uh, school of thought, which gave birth uh, to uh, radical right and especially uh, Nazism. And, uh, they had a kind of uh, fascination, a fantasized idea of what was a Germanic antiquity could have been, combining nationalism, idealism, and of course, racism. So they are using uh, this. You have a different, uh, different uh, uh, justification. For example, in the Ukraine case, they are, they are promoting he, uh, this by using, for example, the writing on, uh, of uh, Dmitro Dansov, uh, which was one of the translators of Hans Gunther, who was an uh, anthropologist uh, who promoted this idea of uh, our uh, Nordic origins of a German uh, race. And uh, uh, Dmitro Dansov actually uh, thought that there was in Ukraine uh, some uh, roots Germanic roots with, uh, for example, the, the influence of the Gulf from uh, from Crimea, for, for example. But uh, in general, uh, Odinism is used for uh, to in the very far right as a political project, a geopolitical one. For in the uh, Ukrainian case, uh, they are using the uh, the Scandinavian origin of the Rus and its founders, the Varangian, to show that Ukraine is the major civilization basin of the Slavic world, and thus to break uh, the old uh, the imperial Russia and Soviet rhetoric that wanted that the Russian people to be at the origin of the civilization. So uh, because they are using it just to, to show that Russia is actually part of Asia and not of, uh, of uh, Europe. But in general, we can see that uh, uh, they are using uh, the imagination of Nordic religions in a militant and also a fighting perspective. Um, to valorize the body, bravery, etc. So here you have a different, uh, uh, different photos from uh, the Young Flame Festival, which was organized by the Nationalist Party uh, National Corpus, uh, National Corps, uh, where you can find actually this uh, this idea of um, pagan, uh, pagan spirit and uh, pagan ethic of uh, sports. So you have uh, you have a knife fighting tournament. You have also uh, I, I, it's absolutely. I know. I think it's uh, it's uh, not true, but they are also uh, making a stenka and stenku, that are wall uh, wall against wall, which is a practice uh, of hand to hand combat, very popular in East Slavic folklore and associated with the god Svaro. Uh, and all these uh, events actually have the same purpose, uh, which is ethnopolitics, which which is a system that tries to protect the biological rules on which the people are based. So sport here and neopaganism implies the idea of the cult of the body proper to the Ukrainian spirit and ethnicity inherited from the Rus. So through this paganetic of sport, the Azov uh, movement and nationalists in general ultimately links the nation to a community based on blood and the sport in a, a, a pagan way of lecture is then reduced to its elitist function to which racism can be grafted. grafted. Uh, they try also to recon to use the paganism to reconnect with the communal lifestyle of the former pagan tribe training in an autarctic way in contact of nature. That's what you can see on the, the as of base in a, in a, uh, in a, in a, in a Mariupol with uh, this uh, this um, idol, but. Uh, uh, also, they are trying to promote paganism because uh, for some extremists, actually, it's uh, it's contrary to the Christian uh, ethic of body, which is considered as uh, a religion uh, responsible for bodily slump. And on the contrary, paganism is presented uh, as a religions of resistance and affirmation of the body power, 
and from uh, for some uh, adepts of this uh, religion uh, it's uh, religion paganism is a religion in which the fighting character of the european people of the ukrainian people is the best expressed in particular of their ability to preserve their uh, internal uh, religions and societal culture uh, against uh, other uh, uh, hegemonic uh, group like uh, russian so, yes, um, you have actually um, idealization here with paganism of the idea of, um, of the body. Uh, they are trying to use uh, sport and to bring paganism to express a new kind of physics, to express a new kind of archetype, which is uh, uh, close to the Varangian uh, uh, one uh, linked to the Nordic. And, uh, uh, and yes, so in this process of uh, representing their identity, uh, they are trying to uh, train uh, uh, um, according to some idealized codes, according to a sacred and warlike hyper masculine model inspired by a kind of distant spiritual heritage. Uh, so, by for example, you can find some uh, uh, some elements of the cult of Thor and this physical exploit, uh, which are compared to the one of uh, Perun in Ukraine. Um, so, they are trying to express here a kind of um, idealized uh, uh, body. Uh, I think uh, I think I, I, I spoke uh, I spoke too much, so I'm going to 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 stop here. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, I would be happy to answer your question or to clarify some of my uh, words. Thank you very much.